All right, so we have been just, oh man, addicted to Jesus this year and presenting the gospel and just the essence and the simplicity of Jesus. And, and, and honestly, like we've been just keeping it simple. And, and I think sometimes that, that is the beauty of the gospel, that it is, it is so deep and it is so complex and it is so mysterious and so fun and so powerful, but yet so simple. And, and I love the gospel and I, I love the kingdom. I, I love how, how God will challenge the most intellect, the most, the most gifted people, right? And pull them in to discover the mysteries and, and to search out the word and, 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 and to search this, this out and, and who Jesus is, right? But yet the littlest children get it. The most simple-minded people get it, right? And, and that's the beauty of the gospel is that no matter where you are in your faith journey, no matter where you are in age or, or whatever it might be, the gospel is for us. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. So, so my dad, he, he kind of kicked us off into the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit uh, um, context a couple weeks ago. But last week, I started just a two-parter. And, and last week was life is in the blood, and talking about the blood of Jesus, that life, literally life, is in the blood. So today is the continuation of that, like I had promised, and says power, the power is in the spirit. And, and we're going to just hone in on that. And, and it is Pentecost Sunday, and those of you who don't know, like, this is like Christmas morning to kids if you're in a charismatic, Pentecostal-rooted uh, church that believes in gifts, Holy Spirit, right? Like, this is like Pentecost Sunday is like Christmas morning to some kids, it's like, yeah, we get Holy Spirit, right? We want to present it today in a way that even, even people that might not be as educated or familiar, and Nicole, my wife, that was up here, she, she grew up in a church that, that was Bible-based, a good church, right? But never spoke about Holy Spirit, never mentioned Holy Spirit. So we, we want to make sure if it's in the Word, we're, we're preaching it. We're not avoiding the things we might be uncomfortable with or unfamiliar with. If it's in the word, we're preaching it. And that's simply what we're going to do today is present the gospel and the promise of the Holy Spirit that God talks about in his word and mostly Acts 1 and 2. So, but Pentecost is, it's this holiday, it's a Jewish holiday, it's celebrated representing first fruits. There was three major holidays in Jewish culture that men would have to go in and celebrate. One of them is Pentecost Sunday, and penta means 50, so it comes from Pentecostus, and it's 50. So 40 days till he resurrected, they waited 10 days in the upper room, 50 days, and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room... Pentecost Sunday. So if you didn't know, that's where part of our name is rooted. That the, I think uh, Upper Room is mentioned like 20 sometimes in the Bible for various things of prayer, supplication, rest, but also the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in the Upper Room. So, so we're going we're gonna to get here uh, for just a moment, but let me show you this video. Um, many of us leaders, we, we decided there's a friend of ours that's spoken here, Peter Lewis. He's from a church called Upper Room Dallas. No affiliation to us, just friends. But Peter came and spoke, and, and many of us leaders, we, we committed to do a thing called Back to the Garden. It was a 12-week, kind of like a, an online course, and you're going to see what we've been watching for roughly 12 weeks. And, and you're going to see a, a clip. It's a five-minute clip of what I felt like the heart of Pentecost Sunday is and what the heart of the gospel is. And I love how he worded it, and, and I remember that I, this was about week four or five into this, and this week was just week 12. We just finished this weekend. And, and it was this beautiful series that we went through, no other than for our leadership to grow in unity and grow in the gospel, and to just grow and do this. Like, we don't have an agenda to make this a curriculum or make this into a small group plan. Who knows what will birth from it? But this was simply just, we love what Peter had on this, and we love what he was doing. So I'd love to show you this clip of him describing the gospel on Pentecost Sunday. So hang loose for about five minutes. And the Father, I picture, like, and so here, here you have this, this picture of, of the Son accomplishing the plan, welcomed back by the Father, being exalted to the right hand of the Father, and he goes, and the Holy Ghost is there, and the Holy Ghost is freaking out. He's so excited. Why? Because finally, finally, the human heart is clean enough, is pure enough, and he's looking at his real estate. He's looking at prime real estate, and he's like, there's 120 in the upper room, and he's looking at them from heaven. The Holy Ghost is looking at, this is Pentecost. The Holy Ghost is like, he is like, that's going to be my home. <gasps> that's going to be my home. Their hearts are going to be my home. In that ache, in the longing, in the heart of God to be one with man, to, be, to, to make man a dwelling place of God. Finally, once and for all, they're like, it's time. 
and they're looking at you, are you ready? He's like, I'm ready, I've been ready, I've been ready for this. Ever since the fall, ever since we, ever since we, we lost that fellowship, I've been ready to get back inside of them. And so, and then, and so now Jesus has the Holy Ghost. He, he, he has the authority and the power, and he looks at the Holy Spirit, and he says, go. Go. Take them. Take possession of their hearts. Those blood-washed hearts, I took their hearts. I scrubbed them so clean. I took out all the sin, and I made it this prime, this prime dwelling place for you, Holy Spirit. No longer are you going to dwell in a box made by man. I made that heart, the creation of God, the image of God is being restored to humanity. They're going to look like my children again. They're going to look like my kids again. No longer molested and defiled and perverted by the devil. No longer under deception. No longer blinded and deceived and twisted and perverted, but pure, holy, blameless sons and daughters of God. That's Pentecost. That's Pentecost. And the result of God dwelling in our heart is power. Why? Because God lives in there. That shouldn't be hard to wrap our minds around, right? right? That's not hard to, like, I'm surprised we don't blow up. More people should, if we really understand Pentecost, we should, the first thought should be, how do we not blow up? Then you have to understand, well, well, man, God, if I don't blow up and die, then you must have really cleansed me. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit? He's holy. There, you can't get any more holy than hol the holiness of God. Stay with me. The holiness of God the very substance, the spirit, the spirit of God is not a, he's a person. He's not just a form or a substance, but he, he is substance, but he's not substance like, like us. He has a substance and a form that's of God. And he's not a, he's not a non-entity. The Holy Spirit is more real than this Bible. It's more real than this ground. He, he's real. He's God himself. He's not a lesser version of God. We know that, right? So how can it be? How, how can we imagine? How can a Christian with a sinful nature, if we still have a sinful nature, how can God of gods, Lord of lords, the very spirit of God himself come and make himself one spirit with me and, and I not die? Not be consumed in a moment. You can't have it both ways. You're either a temple of the most high God or you're a sinner. You can't have it both ways. My, the Bible says, and we're going to look at this, that we have become, our bodies have become temples of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's a massive revelation. And the reason why there's confusion and division and, and even today, I think, a lack of power in the church is because we don't have this, this understanding, this revelation. It's not been included in the gospel, and we have not absorbed the weight and the magnitude of the heart of God in Pentecost, the why behind it. It's been trivialized. It's been trivialized as some extracurricular encounter or mocked or minimized. People are still mocking Pentecost. And I look at Pentecost, and I'm going, this cost Jesus everything. You don't have the gospel. You don't have a Christian without Pentecost. You don't, because that was the purpose for which he did all of the other work in, as Messiah. E let me even make this point. We have chosen, the church as a whole has chosen Easter as the gospel preaching day. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Preach the gospel, uh, gospel at Easter. I love that. The problem is, biblically, just, just as a type or as, a, as an example, as a pattern, the gospel wasn't preached on Easter in my Bible. It was not preached by man on Easter. It, the first time the gospel was ever preached was on Pentecost. Why? Because there was no Holy Ghost to empower them to preach the gospel. Oh, my goodness. So why? So we, it's, like we, it's like we preached it at halftime. The, like the resurrection was halftime in a sense. Like it wasn't, the story wasn't up yet. Oh. Uh, I know, right? All right, you're dismissed. Let's go home. And we're going to preach the gospel today because it's Pentecost and we have the power to do so. Man, I love that clip. And, and I was like, man, it was like we stopped at halftime. And, and I just want to continue on because let me just say this is the Father's heart. The Father's heart is the fullness of the gospel. Not just stopping at crucifixion. Not just stopping at resurrection. But the promise of the Holy Spirit. And not just, not just stopping at Holy Spirit. Not just, it, there is a promise of his return. There is a promise of his return for eternity. This is, this is a beautiful thing to, to us believers. We, we get to look forward to an eternity with the Father. We, we not only get to be empowered and have a heaven ticket for eternity and be empowered by the Spirit, we get to look forward and have a joyous hope of His return. Whether we get our upgrade some other way or He returns, we get to spend eternity face to face with the Messiah, with the Creator, with the Father, with, like Baylor said, the Comforter, the guide, the friend, the encourager. This is who we get to spend eternity with face to face for all of eternity. And it's never going to get boring, old, or dumb. 
Oh man, all of heaven's creatures, they never get bored singing the same song over and over and over because he's that majestic. He's that amazing. He's that awesome. The gospel keeps going, right? So there's this thing, but so many of us, we, we, we have maybe grown up in churches or been around Christians that just cut it off. Like, okay, he's resurrected. Yes, he is alive. Come on. There's a difference between our God and a dead God. He is alive and he is well, and his church is alive and well. So, so there's, that's part of the gospel. This is the gospel. His Holy Spirit is part of the gospel. And, and let me just go to Acts 1.1. Now, now, let me just give you a little history here. Actually, Luke wrote, it's in most, if not all, of Acts. So Luke, this is a continuation of his gospel. Here's how it says in Luke, in, in Acts 1.1. It says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. So Acts is a continuation of now he is resurrected. Now he has returned. You have seen him after 40 days. He appeared to us, and he's going through Acts 1 here. And now, now he's promising Holy Spirit. Now he's promising an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, right? He's promising his return. And as last week, we kind of went into Acts 1, and we talked about the cleansing of his blood. We talked about the promise of Holy Spirit, and we talked about these things. So here we're continuing on because Luke is even saying, this is a continuation. I began... To, to, to explain to you and teach you guys what Jesus began to teach. Now I'm continuing to say the story's not over yet. So what happens is they go and they, they wait in the upper room. They take care of a little business and they wait there and then Acts 2 happens. But first, Acts 1-4, it says this. It says, because Jesus said, go wait. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. So now we get to Acts 2. Now here it is. Just surprised we don't blow up. I love that part. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers... I'm going to read all of Acts 2. Is that okay? I'm going to just break it down. We're going to read it. And, and, I'll, and I love how Peter, not this Peter, Peter in Acts 2 shares the gospel of Jesus to the early church. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they were heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they explained. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, and it lists all the areas that they were from. And it says, and we will hear all these people speaking our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. And it says, but others in the crowd ridiculed them. Somebody mentioned earlier, like, like we are, they, people are still, or Peter just mentioned, people are still ridiculing the day of Pentecost. I find it easy to, to point at things and not trust things that you've not experienced. I find it easier to be a spectator and, and, a, and an armchair quarterback on the things we haven't experienced. Let, let me briefly share my story. For some of you who may not know some of the story, I mentioned it last week. My, I was raised by, by pastors. I, I was raised in a, in, a, in a denomination that was solid in Holy Spirit and, 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 and the works of Holy Spirit. Relational things happened that I saw at a young age, around 12, and I said, you know what? That's, that's, that's not for me. And I turned my back and started in, a, in an alcohol and pornography addiction from the age of 12 all the way to my mid-20s. I turned to basically agnostic, atheist kind of thing to not believe in God. So obviously did not believe in the gifts because in my experience and what I was, was seeing from my perspective, they were being abused. And, and, and I was seeing people do get, operate in gifts, operate in tongues, operate in interpretation of tongues, all these things, right? And then telling racial jokes or, or, or doing these things behind the scenes that were certainly not the love of God. So, so turn my back. Now, now, what happened with me was it was, it was this crazy thing that, that where Nicole and I decided to, uh, Nicole was serving in an upper room back when it was on 4th Street, 
And, and I was just there because I was being married to Nicole. And my dad had planted a church, and I figured, well, I'd at least honor him and attend. So I was playing drums, mostly hung over, and showing up. And, and my dad said, hey, why don't you go to this church in Indiana? I, I hear they're doing some pretty cool things, because Nicole and I said, you know what? Wednesday night Bible study is boring. Let's start a youth group so these kids don't have to suffer and we don't have to suffer. So the two youth members and us started a youth group. And, and then my dad sent us to Indiana. Now, this was a total setup from God. In that moment, I didn't even believe in God. I was like, no, it's just a control system to make people be good. And this was all just a good literary to make people act good and keep people in line in our culture. And I show up at this church, and they pull us to the front, and... They said, out of honor for Greg Simmons, we, he, we've got some guests here, and we're going to ask them to come up to the front, and their entire church surrounds us and lays hands on us. Now, I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I was one of those people saying, they must be drunk. They must be idiots. This is, what is this show, right? And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit hit me, and I began to speak in another language, and I began to feel electricity run over and over and over my body. And I hadn't cried in five years. And I began to weep and just be a, a snotting, blubbering mess on the floor at this point. Because I needed a rewiring. There was something that was ingrained in my heart and my head that was the lies of the enemy that was not God. Now, we are not trying to force anything on it. This is not a story of the haves and the have-nots. This is not a thing of, of measurement. This is a, a gift that's offered to us, and this is my story, that I didn't even believe in God, and all of a sudden, God's like, no, I'm gonna let you believe in all of it. And, and, and then I said, well, geez, if that's all true, then the healings must be true, too, and raising dead people must be true, too. I've seen nine people raised from the dead for through laying on of hands. On, not, not through medicine, not through shocking. I'm a paramedic, and it's cool, right? I get to see that part, too. But through, through the laying on of hands, I've seen radical stories of healing. I've seen, I've seen broken sh arms sh literally straighten out through the power of prayer. We've seen scoliosis here healed. Cancer tumors fall off and dissolve in an instant. Because when I went into this, this, this none of this is in notes. I just feel the power to share my story for a second. It, it's one thing to read it. It's another thing to receive it. If you don't know the God of the word, it's just, it's just words, right? But now I believe in the word of God because I met the God of the word. Amen. And all of a sudden, these things come to life, say, wow, it's all true. I want to teleport. I want to walk through walls. I want to walk on water. I want to be taken up in a chariot of fire. Some people say, well, Christianity is boring. No, you're boring because you haven't read your word. Because then all of a sudden, it was like phew, the scales were removed. I'm like, it's all true. This is amazing. I had to experience it to believe it. I had to receive it to believe it. And, and many people, they're speculating. They're saying, no, this, this can't happen. No, that's just for the days of then. Okay, what about as you continue on through the next several years through Acts and later on chapters and then Acts 19 and then you go into the other New Testament books of, of the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. No, it wasn't just for that one day of the day of Pentecost. It's continued on after that. The, the, the healings didn't stop when Jesus left the earth. Read your Bible. Let me continue on or else we're going to be here all day. I don't even know where I was. Let's go back to Acts 2. All right. But others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Oh, it's about to get good. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Now, no, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Now, here comes some fruits of the Holy Spirit. Joel 2 is what he's referencing. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will what? Prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So we get to prophesy, have visions, have dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red. We've seen some of those recently, haven't we? Before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. Here's the promise of the return. 
but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as well as you know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of the lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But this is the gospel, y'all. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referencing to himself for the died, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet and knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in a grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted in the place of the highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. They're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. That's far too early to be drunk. Even though it's 5 o'clock somewhere, it's 9 a.m. here. Just as you see and hear today, for David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Now, come on. How many know you have some dominion and power under your feet? Another reference that you will crush Satan under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Imagine that gospel message being preached with the power now of the Holy Spirit. Now now watch what happens. Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We start growth track today. So that means in four weeks we get some baptisms. You repent. You ask Jesus into your heart. You receive the gift of salvation. You get baptized. It's awesome. We're, we're just right on time here. We'll baptize you today if you need it. We'll figure it out. We'll go down. We got a pool. We got a river. It, we'll, it'll work. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, come on. You get saved. You're believers. Now you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, much longer than I today, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now, now here's, here's some cool fruit. These were the first fruits of Pentecost. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. With the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel being preached, all of a sudden people were just like, yes, I want that. Now, here's what happens. I love the fruit of the community of believers coming together now. Because let me just say, God doesn't just stop at at people getting saved and doing their own thing. There's a family. There's a community. There's a body that now we get to encourage one another. We get to pray for one another. We get to be there for one another. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them. All the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I love being in a church that we believe still to this day in signs, wonders, miracles. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. We we only ask for 10% here. We need to sell everything. We're not going to live in a compound here. God only asked for 10%. Some people are arguing, well, that's Old Testament. All right, you want the New Testament version? Here you go. 
Sell it all. Give it to the church. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Now, come on. This is the fruit of the embodiment of the Holy Spirit in community. Joy and generosity. They worshiped together. They prayed together, right? They had unity. They had signs, wonders, and miracles, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people, even the EGRs, extra grace required people. It says all people. Come on, you know all know you got some difficult people in your life. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship who were being saved. That's revival, y'all. That's revival from an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the simplicity of the gospel. That's revival because people wanted what they had. It wasn't some fake thing. It wasn't a bigger screen. It wasn't, it wasn't a better program. It was, it was they had the authenticity and the, they were genuine and they, they hungered and thirst for the Lord. That was it. They loved one another. They loved God. They, they had captured the greatest commandment to love God with everything they had and to love their neighbor as themselves. They had captured it, and now all of a sudden now there's signs, wonders, miracles. There's generosity. There's joy. They're coming together in fellowship. They're breaking bread together. They're having, they're having fellowship, and now people are being added daily, and people are being saved. Why? Because they had the real deal. I've noticed that signs, wonders, and miracles sometimes last and sometimes don't. I've, I've noticed that a lot of times there's people that will come in here off the street, get totally radically healed. I'm talking radically healed, and within a year they're, they're back on the street. Why? Because they didn't cap capture necessarily the depth of the gospel of his love, of identity, of the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I'll just be honest, sometimes signs and wonders sell pretty cheap. That oil is kind of cheap. When I start seeing he a lot of healings, I begin to worship it and forget who was the healer. And, and, when, when I, and I started to honestly get a little arrogant about it. Like, oh, wow, I've seen a thousand healings now. And, and, and what happens was God gave me this revelation that it's not the healing that matters. It's all about the healer. And a, and a sign or a wonder or a miracle is literally just the love of the Father revealing himself in that manner to that person the way they need it in that moment. So that's, that's the seed. And then all of a sudden, if there's a healing, let's say, or a prophetic word that reaches you or something like that, or today something captures you, that's the seed that's supposed to produce a harvest of stuff like this. That's a seed that's to produce a harvest of, I want to go deeper in the Lord. I want to experience the fullness of him. I want to grow closer to him. I want to be in communion with him. I, I, want, I want to worship him. I want to grow deep and get rooted in relationship. So, so it, it's kind of like <laughs> dating for the wrong reasons, if you catch what I mean. The physical things sell cheap, and that's easy. And you can move from person to person to person, thing to thing to thing, right? But, but when you get the love involved, all of a sudden, there is a sustaining relationship that's rooted and grounded in love. All right, I'm talking about Holy Spirit. Let me get back here. That's, that's my old dating stuff when I was a youth pastor. Acts 1.8. Let's, let's go there. Let's move on here. I, I'm going to ask Baylor and the team to start making their way up. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, now there is, there is this, there is, Baylor was talking about when you ask Jesus in your heart, the Spirit comes in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, okay? Let's get that very clear, that he can't dwell in an unclean vessel. You get clean, he dwells in you, and, and there, is, there is a special thing there of intimacy and relationship with the Father, okay? When you accept Jesus, he dwells in you. What we're talking about here, I want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you. There's in you and upon you. So, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, if you remember last week, we referenced this was a group of believers. They already believed in Jesus. The 120 were already believers. Now they are waiting for the Holy Spirit of an outpouring and an infilling. So there's a difference because the Holy Spirit in you is for you. The Holy Spirit upon you is for others. So Acts 1.4 says this. Once when, we were, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he had promised, I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So water baptism, you're baptized by a preacher or, or a minister or somebody that's into water publicly identifying with Jesus. Spirit baptizes, you're baptized by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And it's referenced in Matthew 3.11, John 1.33, and the purpose is to receive power. So Matthew 3.11 says this, I baptize you. John the Baptist is saying this. 
I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Last week, I referenced my story about being baptized in fire. I had no idea what it was. I had never read it in the Bible. I, I didn't understand what it was. A, a guy by the name of Jonathan Miller at a youth camp called, it, called us out. He's like, you, you're gonna be, the Holy Spirit's gonna baptize you in fire. I raised my hands and all of a sudden fire came from the tips of my fingers all the way into my heart and it felt like I was burning. Like I was literally on fire. And I just melted in the presence and the power of Jesus. I was like, I don't know what just happened, but I liked it and it was cool, let's go. Ephesians 5.18 says this, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The original text in that is translated to a present tense, a continual tense, and now. So, so sometimes we, we get to sing, so, well, well, I was filled back this many years ago. I was filled with the Spirit. Or I, yeah, that's great. So what's been your continual relationship? I, I can't just tell Nicole once that I love her and I'm done. Like, okay, good, we're good for the rest of our lives. No, we, we need that continual affirmation, that continual connection, that continual intimacy and encouragement. And how are you? Last night, we, we hadn't connected much. It's been a busy, busy season. And I was gone yesterday working at the fire department a couple of different times for the, fire, for the strawberry festival. And Nicole was gone with the kids working the strawberry festival booth. So finally last night, I was like, you want a campfire? It's like 10 o'clock at night. She's like, yeah. I was like, and then the kids were like, can we come out? We're like, no, inside, now. <laughs> we just sat there and talked like, hey, how was your conversation with your dad today? I, you know, and how, what, what did you, you know, what happened in your day? We were connecting. There was this, our hearts were being filled up with each other's love because we cared enough about each other to ask and to share and to talk. What are your challenges? What, what was the hardest thing of your day today? What do we got going on tomorrow? It's this connection time. It's the same thing of, of, I don't want this one and done. I want this continual communion with the Lord, this continual relationship with Holy Spirit. As Peter said, Holy Spirit's a person. It's not this mystical, far-off thing that's scary and weird. No, it is the third part of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, and so many churches avoid the third, a third, 33 and a third percent, whatever, of, of the Godhead. It's not some weird, kooky, weird thing. No, he is intimate. He is a comforter. He's a guide. He's a friend. He's an encourager, and he's power. Let, let, me, let me wrap this deal up here. One of the common signs in, in, in Acts, specifically Acts 2, obviously, Acts 10, Acts 19, was, was outward tongues, when there was a baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit, there was, there was outward tongues, and five times this happened in Acts. So that's a common sign, but it's not the only sign. Let, let, me, let me just be honest with you. I feel that there's fruits of the Holy Spirit that are listed in Galatians 5 that we should also be operating. If the Holy Spirit is filling us, we should be operating in love, not just tongues. Like, like tongues is, is great, and we don't ever want to minimize that as a sign and a, and a gift, Right? But you can have tongues, but if you're not operating in power or love or kindness or gentleness or joy, then what's the point of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I mean, just to be really honest with you, the other thing is Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses. You will share with others. You will tell everybody and, and it lists these areas in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. So, so it's this cool thing that the Holy Spirit also has this, this power, this, the presence and the purpose. That, that there's this power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, presence, and you will be my witnesses and share with everybody everywhere. It's, it's this cool thing of like, you will operate in power, that's, that's a sign, you will have his presence, in his presence is the fullness of what? joy you'll have joy and you will be essentially the first ordained evangelist is what he's saying purpose you'll be my witnesses these are signs like I, I don't know about you when I receive a gift I like to share with the people around me that might find interest in that when I started smoking meat by the way last week's meat turned out great for those of you who were wondering because we went a little late in service and I my temp was rising on my phone and I had to get back because I still have to have to stoke the fire and do the old school method I don't have those auto feeders like some of you fortunate people 
and lazy people. No, I'm just kidding. Right, Jared? So when I got this smoker, Matt Buer gifted me this smoker that he no longer uses because he upgraded because he was going to graduate to being an auto feeder. I, sent, I started sending pictures of these meats and the smoke and asking questions about Tim. And I, and I started seeing, like, I'd cut that and, like, look at those burn marks to all of my friends that I knew smoked me. All of them. I just created a, a, a text group. I was like, look at this, guys. It's the same thing. When we receive something, when we receive the gift of salvation, when we receive a miracle, when we receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we should be telling people to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. It's the same thing. If you received a, 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 an incredible um, progress in, a, in, in something medical and you went to a doctor and got treatment and was healed or whatever and, and, and had this success or had this great chi chiropractor that you had back pain, now you're totally free of back pain, you're going to say, you need to go to this person. And then you call and they're no longer accepting patients and then you're mad. It's our chiropractor. Sorry, you can't go to her. So, but anyway, there, that's the thing. So to be his witnesses. So that is also a sign that we've received something powerful, that we've received something good, is that we get to be witnesses. Last thing is the fruits of the Spirit, like I mentioned, but I want to read them. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law <laughs> there's no law against being kind there's no law against having love there's it's not illegal to love somebody <laughs> it is not illegal to be generous to somebody it's not illegal to be patient with somebody and that's the benefit that is the glory that is the fruit of the spirit that I get to operate in self-control that is an empowerment of the spirit that no, I don't have to look at that thing anymore. No, I don't have to partake in that thing anymore. No, I don't have to gossip with the guys like, like, like I used to. I don't have to laugh at that joke that's inappropriate anymore. I have self-control. I'm gonna remove myself from that because I've got the spirit that's living in me and I have power to do so. Let, let, me, let me close this out. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit's a gift. The Holy Spirit is a promise. The baptism of the Spirit is a gift. It is not a have and have nots. It's not a measurement tool. It's not this thing to where, well, I'm better than you. No, it's like, man, at first I was operating before that with, with just a hand screwdriver. Now I get the power drill. Come on. Faster, better, more powerful. So, why don't you stand with me? Honestly, Baylor already offered the invitation that if you wanted a comfort or an encourage or a friend, I'm going to offer you the invitation if you want baptized in the Holy Spirit. I, we were at a, a youth conference in the a winter several years ago, and Reinhard Bunke, if you've not heard of him, you need to look him up. He's just one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Reinhard Bunke was there speaking, and he has a gift to, to, to impart through the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and he's like, if anybody wants to receive the baptism, we're all sitting on the floor in this huge call, in this huge conference center or whatever, probably six or 10,000 teenagers there. And if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just stand up. And we had a few of our kids just stand up. We're like, okay, cool. And he's like, and he tells this story about, I think his grandfather or somebody laying hands on him before he died or an uncle, maybe it was an uncle. And, and all of a sudden it was just like, all right, we're just going to pray this prayer. And if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God will give you a sign. You'll begin to speak in another language and you'll receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was just so effortless. It was so casual. And I think 100% of the kids that we had there that stood up received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in that way. It's funny. I was like, man, that's not how I grew up. <laughs> People yelling at you. <laughs> say this, no, say this, don't say anything. Ay, 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 ay thought this was a gift. I don't want to tarry for it. No, just tarry. Don't tarry, tarry. Don't tarry. Back for it. Don't back for it. Say, yeah, say, just say Jesus. Don't say anything. This feels like it's not a gift. I feel like I need to earn this, but I don't know what you're saying and I don't know what to do. Listen, it's never intended to be that. Listen, maybe you desire it today and you walk out of here. Um, man, <laughs> we had, uh, <laughs> the guys are going to laugh. 
we, we, I had kids in the youth group. They're like, I, I want that. And Michael was getting so frustrated. We're like, Michael, man, chill out. It's a gift. He's going to give it to you. Just relax, man. Just, just receive it. But I want it now. And he gets so violently mad about it. I was like, man, that is never the heart of this gift. The heart of this gift is love. It's empowerment. It's grace. It's goodness, right? So, so we'd have these kids, and they, they, they'd pray, and like, I remember Heath's story. He's like, I woke up one night, and there was like this fire in my belly, and I didn't know what to do, and then boom, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit in your bed, right? It was in your bed. We had another kid on the toilet. <laughs> He's like, oh, so I was on the toilet, and I just prayed. I was praying to God. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and right there on the toilet. <laughs> like, okay, God, whatever. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around any of this anymore. So, so here's the deal. We're just simply going to raise your hand. If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're just going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to pour in here like the day of Pentecost, like a mighty rushing wind. And maybe you'll receive it instantaneously right in this moment. Maybe it'll be tonight in your sleep. Maybe not on the pot. Maybe so. I don't know. But either way, it is a beautiful gift. It's empowerment. And, and I believe the Holy Spirit is, is here today just as much as he was 2,000 years ago, pouring out the same gift. His, his, it's amazing that people that are uncomfortable and like are weird about this, they're like they'll, they'll, they'll sing these songs right that we sing and, and they'll, they'll quote these verses. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, then he still heals. He still delivers and he still pours out the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidences. And there's still gifts in operation. The Bible says, seek after all the gifts. It says, and it, and it really translates to earnestly desire them. Seek after them, desire them, want them with a fire. Like, I want all the gifts. Matthew 7, 11 says this. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So today all we're going to do is ask. I asked the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, you just come through and sweep through. And people who want it just receive it. That's it. That was my prayer this morning, throughout this week. It was like, well, we're not going to make a show of it. It's those who want it, just receive it. So if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we just raise your hand. Maybe you need a fresh infilling like Baylor said. It's a fresh infilling. We're just, all we're going to do is cry out to the Lord and just ask Him. So in your own way, just ask Him. The Bible says if you ask anything in His name, He'll do it. So Holy Spirit. We ask for a baptism of your spirit right now, baptism of spirit and fire. We ask for an infilling in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, sweep through this place and those who are encountering you online right now, Lord, with power. We ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit with tongues and power, with the fruits of your spirit, Jesus. If you're around one of those people with a hand up, just, just put a hand on them. Just begin to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill them. Fill us, Jesus. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Fill us, Holy Spirit. We thank you. We thank you for the gift of the baptism of your Spirit. We thank you for the power that when your Spirit comes upon us, we have power. Thank you, Jesus. If you begin to feel something, just rise up. Just let it out. If you begin to feel something that just is so to the point of overflow, just begin to release that. Just begin to release that sound. Begin to sing in that sound. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. More, Holy Spirit. More. More. We pray for fresh fire, fresh fire, fresh anointing, Jesus, fresh purpose, fresh power. Lord, fill us with your presence. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He is like rain. The Bible says to, to pray in English and pray in tongues. It says to sing. Paul says to sing in tongues and sing with understanding. So right now, feel free to do either. 
Feel free to pray and sing in, in the spirit if you wish. Maybe God just gave you a new gift. It's like any language. We need to learn that language and exercise that language. Thank you, Jesus. Stay here one more moment. Yes, Lord. Like a wind, like a fresh fire with fire over our heads, Lord. Sweet through. Thank you, Jesus.